Okay, so here they're asking us compound which has the highest thermal stability is going to be what? Let's take a look at our options. So you have ASH3, PH3, NH3, SBH3. What are these? These are hydrides of group 15 elements. So we are talking about the thermal stability of group 15 elements. Okay. So first thing we need to know is that we are talking about a p-block hydride, right? A set of p-block hydrides, which means these are going to be covalent in nature. So what we need to address here is the fact uh, about how effective is the overlap, right? Okay, so let's take a look. So here we are talking about group 15 elements. So you have nitrogen, phosphorus, arsenic, antimony, and then you have bismuth. Correct, this is how your group 15 looks like. Now, as you go down the group, what happens? As you go down the group, size increases, right? Size increases and you are talking about hydride, which means, which means the effective overlap will be higher when you have a smaller size, okay? So here, if you have, uh, you know, size increasing as you go down the group, I can say that the effective overlap will be decreasing as we go down the group because of which what happens is the thermal stability the thermal stability will decrease as we go down the group okay so which one is going to be the most stable the one with the smallest size which one has the smallest size nitrogen of course so which of these is going to be the most thermally stable nh3 right so ammonia or nh3 is going to have the highest thermal stability so yes, let's come back to our options. We can see ammonia in option C, which means option C, NH3 is going to be the right answer to this question. All right, so here they're asking us which molecule will act as both Bronsted acid and base, right? And here are your options. Option A is H2O water, option B is methane CH4, option C is BF3, and option D is NaOH, okay? So out of these three, we need to talk, uh, so out of these four, we need to talk about which one can behave as both a Bronsted acid and a base, okay? So first, let's get into a small discussion about what is a Bronsted acid and what is a Bronsted base. So here, of course, we are talking about the Bronsted-Lowry theory, right? So here you have Bronsted-Lowry theory of acids and bases and this theory said that if a certain substance needs to act as an acid it should be able to donate proton right it should be able to donate a proton and if a certain substance has to behave as a base it should be able to accept protons so proton donors are acids and proton acceptors are bases and here in this question they're asking which species can act as both bronsted acid as well as bronsted base so what does it mean it means the molecule that you choose should have the capacity to accept a proton as well as donate a proton depending on what condition you are looking at okay so yes we have a very classic case here so you have h2o liquid right so if i say you have two h2o liquid in equilibrium which with h3o plus plus oh minus what is this here you can see that water is behaving both as a bronsted acid as well as a bronsted base this is something we call autoprotolysis so what is happening here is that if i say you have two water molecules okay so you have two water molecules so this is my first water molecule which i have written such that i can break the bonds and this is your second water molecule, okay? Now here, what I'm saying is, um, let me use a different color. So, okay, so here you have these two units, right? What I'm saying is this molecule is going to behave as an acid, how it is releasing this proton. So here, this is behaving as an acid, okay? It released the proton and it gave it to this water molecule which means here this is behaving as an acid and by accepting that proton this other water molecule is behaving as a base according to Bronsted-Lowry theory and this is the concept behind autoprotolysis. So yes this is where you can see that water is behaving both as an acid as well as a base which means without a shadow of doubt you should be able to mark option A as the right answer to this question. So let's quickly take a look. So option A H2O is going to be the right answer to this question. All right, so here they're asking us which of the following is a polar compound, okay? Let's take a look at the options. So option A is C2H6. This is nothing but ethane. Then you have CCl4, carbon tetrachloride. Then you have HCl, okay? So hydrogen chloride. Then you have CH4, which is methane, okay? So out of these four molecules, we need to, uh, we need to be able to uh, figure out which of these is polar in nature. So what do we know? We know that if 
for a certain molecule if i can say if i can say that the mu net mu net is not equal to 0 then it is going to be polar in nature okay so that is the condition i need so let's take a look at the molecules so first molecule you have is c2h6 correct so i'm going to write c2h6 here so what is this ethane okay so in case of ethane the structure that you're looking at is going to be this right now fundamentally fundamentally what you need to understand is that carbon and hydrogen have a very very low electronegativity difference and you have one carbon carbon bond so overall for this molecule whatever dipole moment you get because this is going to be symmetrical your mu net is going to cancel out you will get mu net is equal to zero this is a vector calculation remember i'm not diving into this too much because we've studied this way back in chemical bonding right so here you know that this is a non-polar molecule here your mu net is equal to zero then you have ccl4 okay so in case of ccl4 what is the molecule that we're looking at so you have a tetrahedral structure like this okay all right so here what you have you have a carbon chlorine bond now you know chlorine is definitely more electronegative so chlorine is going to pull the bond pair of electrons towards it like this okay and this is going to be the case for all the four bonds so yes this is how your individual bond moments are going to be now when you sum it up when you do the vector addition when you take the bond angle and do the vector addition what you will see is that your net dipole moment is going to be equal to zero so here also you have mu net is equal to zero okay important idea ccl4 has polar bonds but the molecule overall is going to be non-polar okay cool next we have hcl hydrogen chloride okay so here what happens is you have a bond between hydrogen and chlorine chlorine is definitely more electronegative it is pulling the bond pair of electrons towards itself so because of this can i say it is a polar molecule yes definitely you have just one bond moment and that bond moment is going to be your net dipole moment and that bond moment is not equal to zero which means here your mu net is going to be not equal to zero then you have ch4 this is very very similar to ccl4 again you have a carbon hydrogen bond which is going to have very low electronegativity difference so no matter which direction the bond moment is in it is all going to get cancelled out because of the vector addition okay so yes this is what you need to know here you have mu net is equal to zero okay this is what we get now let's check we have one place where mu net is not equal to zero that is an option c which means option c hcl hydrogen chloride is going to be the right answer to this question okay let's take a look at this question so this question is saying which of the following cannot exist in enolic form okay so here we have keto forms of some molecule and we are talking about the enolic form so the moment you hear keto enol what should be the word that comes to mind the word you're looking for is tautomerism okay so you need to look for a molecule which cannot exhibit tautomerism okay so you have keto form of certain molecules you have three molecules here whose keto form is given you need to look for the one which cannot have an enol form okay so here you need to look for you need to look for alpha hydrogen okay so you need wherever you have your carbonyl group on the alpha uh, carbon you need to have a hydrogen that is when it is possible for your molecule to show in all form no matter how little no matter how unstable they're just asking us whether you can have an in all form that is the question here okay so yes that is what we're looking for and as you can see option a is satisfying adjacent to the carbonyl uh, carbon you have a carbon which has hydrogen so yes you have alpha hydrogen on the sp3 hybridized carbon so yes option a is satisfying similarly with option c as well right you have a carbonyl carbon and look at the carbon to the right of this carbonyl carbon okay so here yes you have a sp3 hybrid carbon which has an alpha hydrogen so yes this carbon has an alpha so this carbon has a hydrogen which means what which means according to the carbonyl group i can say yes we have an alpha hydrogen so yes here you will see the presence of an enol form which is unfortunately not the case with option b so option b is 
benzaldehyde, okay, your PHCHO. And here, your alpha carbon is not even sp3 hybridized, okay. So, no, there is no scope for enol form. There is no scope for the existence of the enolic form in benzaldehyde. And you can see, see, you might get confused that, okay, you have your carbonyl carbon and to the right of it, there is a hydrogen. But remember, that is not the alpha hydrogen. That is the hydrogen of that carbonyl carbon. It's not the hydrogen of the adjacent carbon. We be very, very careful about this, okay. So, option B is going to be the right answer that is option b benzaldehyde will not have an enolic form option b is the right answer to this question let's move on all right so here they're asking us le chatelier's principle is not applicable to which of the following reactions okay and here you have your reactions Op option a is h2 plus i2 is giving you 2hi all three of them are gaseous in nature then you have option b fe plus s is giving you fes okay then you have option C, N2 plus 3H2 is giving you 2NH3. All three of them are again gaseous in nature. Option D, if you see, is saying N2 plus O2 is in equilibrium with 2NO and all three of them are gaseous in nature. Okay, so what can you observe? You can observe that barring option B, okay, barring option B, all the other options have gaseous components, okay? Which means what? Which means definitely there's something different with option B. All three reactants and products, all of them are solid, which means this is where we can't apply Le Chatelier's principle. Because see, no matter what you do, see, what is Le Chatelier's principle? That if I make a change to a system at equilibrium, right? If I go and alter the volume or if I go and alter the pressure, temperature, sorry, uh, pressure or volume, then the system will try to move in a direction such that it can nullify the change that I have made to the system. That is what Le Chatelier's principle is. Okay, although the original equilibrium will never be restored, the system will try to oppose the change that I have made and achieve a new equilibrium. Yes, so that is what Le Chatelier's principle suggests. But when you talk about solids, right, when you talk about solids, all this uh, pressure and volume, these uh, ideas become absurd. They cannot be applied to solids in a way that they can be applied to liquids and gases. Again, which is why we talk more about, you know, gases and dilute solutions in equilibrium chapter if you remember okay so solids is one place where if you have a completely solid equilibrium you can't really apply the Chatelier's principle to that system okay so yes that's my two bits on this question which means what's the right answer where can you not apply the Chatelier's principle on the reaction in option b so option b is going to be the right answer to this question